Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're going to be talking about Beyond Zero, uh, eliminating vulnerabilities in the PyTorch container images. This is a uh, an effort that concluded a couple of months ago uh, that focuses on minimizing uh, the vulnerabilities. First, uh, my name is Dan Fernandez. I'm a product manager at a company called ChainGuard. Today, I'm joined by Patrick Smith, who's a staff uh, developer relations engineer at ChainGuard, and Tristy Hedje, who's a deliver engineer. Uh, we wanted to start by going over a little bit about why containers are also ideal for AI applications, just like they are for other applications. And it has to do with a few of their properties, such as their portability. So you have a consistent development and production environments, which makes it easier when you make the transition. Um, it also offers efficiency, because it allows you to scale with the growing demands. And lastly, it offers uh, some isolation, not uh, full isolation. Uh, and this encapsulation of apps in general uh, that is consistent across environments also allows for uh, the possibility of hybrid workloads, which a lot of large organizations are starting to uh, or continuing to transition into. We also wanted to share some metrics around the overall adoption of containers for AI applications and uh, start with, as of the end of 2023, is the latest data on it, there was a 58% increase on GPU instance hours usage. This was by a report uh, from Datadog. Uh, and this has to do with, as you may imagine, the increase in the need for both uh, training and inference workloads associated with Gen AI applications. There's also an interesting metric here, and this is more of a forecast, but while AI components have not made it to every uh, enterprise application, even though it, it sure feels like it. It is estimated that by 2025, 90% of most enterprise applications uh, will have some AI component within them. And lastly, the hosting or the spend for cloud resources associated with uh, cloud applications is estimated to be uh, $200 billion by the end of 2030, and this was by a, a cloud revenue estimate that was offered by Goldman Sachs. So this kind of gives you an idea of like why is it that we uh, decided to focus on this, but obviously we're uh, a PyTorch conference, and we wanted to highlight that really the, the important part here is that PyTorch has become, uh, and it has a key role in the AI supply chain, and it is because it has widespread use for both deploying and developing models. The flexibility, the strength of the community, and the ease of use uh, has made it one of the most popular container images across the board. And that means that it has now become the foundation to a lot of libraries and projects. Um, and due to the far-reaching scope and use cases for the, the, this specific technology, it now also means that the attack surface for AI applications via PyTorch has also increased significantly over time. Um, so any organization, any... Uh, enterprise that is deploying an AI application that is concerned with data privacy uh, also now has to be concerned with maintaining all the components, in this case, container images, uh, making sure that they're up to date. And that's what we're going to focus on the rest of this presentation, where Patrick is going to walk us through some of the metrics around vulnerabilities associated with the PyTorch image. All right, thanks, Dan. Yeah, so PyTorch has been downloaded over 10 million times in the last year. Um, and so, you know, this is an application that really matters in terms of, you know, if you secure PyTorch, the PyTorch container image, you're securing literally millions of deployments across the planet. So let's dig a little bit into PyTorch in terms of security. So um, the last build of the PyTorch container image had a critical uh, five high, 40 medium, and over 50 low uh, CVEs. Um, and, you know, you might be like, hey, that sounds like a lot. That's actually not that far off industry standard, which is you know sl maybe even slightly unfortunate. Um, unfortunately, CVEs do really matter. Um, so what are CVEs? They are common vulnerabilities and exposures. They are known vulnerabilities in software that actually affect the security posture of that software. Um, and CVEs are you know they can be looked up in a database. So these are vulnerabilities that uh, can should, and in some cases must, in the case of, for example, FedRAMP compliance, be remediated. Um, so if you're doing FedRAMP, you need to fix them within a month, and that's, that's what you need to do. So 
Uh, unfortunately, there's an upstream problem. So if you're um, someone who wants to run a model in inference, wants to develop an application, uh, then probably about two, maybe 2% 2 of the CVEs that are in that application, uh, that code, um, that production deployment, or might be introdu introduced by your team. The rest come from upstream, whether it be language runtimes, whether they be uh, OS. Uh, and you know, as as the the person at the end of that, you're responsible for it. But how do you fix all of that? It becomes very difficult. You have to employ CVE remediation teams and so on. So at ChainGuard, we um, create low to no, frequently zero CVE images. And how do we do that? We do a couple of different things. Um, we build fresh. Uh, we patch when needed. Uh, we issue advisories, and we really strive for min the images to be as minimal as possible. And when you're aiming for zero. Every uh, removed package really matters um, because pa every package is a potential source of CVs that could pop up literally any day. Um, and so in terms of zero, well, is zero just a marketing thing? I mean, maybe some of you have used CV scanners, maybe you've played around with this. Um, if you're responsible for this, you probably you may never have actually seen a scan come back zero CVs. But but and when I joined Chainguard, I was like, this is just marketing. But actually, you know, we work really hard at this. Um, we do it every day, and we actually do get to zero CVEs, uh, which is kind of remarkable. Uh, and I'm still surprised by it, but it's possible. <laughs> um, so let's get a little into the nitty gritty. So um, just to talk about minimal for for a minute. Um, so this is a uh, comparison of the uh, attack surface of the current PyTorch image versus the uh, recently built ChainGuard uh, our ChainGuard PyTorch image. And I'm speaking specifically speaking about the runtime PyTorch, PyTorch image here. So if you look here, we have about 75 in the uh, chain packages in the ChainGuard PyTorch image versus about 200 in the uh, current PyTorch image and. Uh, we have about 400 executables versus 1,400 in the current PyTorch image. So I'm going to hand things over to Shrishti, and she can go, go into a little more detail. Thank you. So uh, talking about the minimal set of packages, what it really means is a reduction in the image size. Uh, and case in point, uh, our ChainGuard's PyTorch image is actually uh, nearly half the size of the upstream image, as you see it there. Uh, so talking about how we arrived there, uh, there are a couple of things. So we also ship a prod and a dev variant of the image. And within our prod variant, we've stripped a lot of things. Uh, that, that's uh, your shell and development utilities, diagnostic tools, network libraries. We've also tried to like greatly reduce the complexities introduced by package managers by stripping them down to the bare minimum again. But uh, not all case use cases are prod use cases. There are cases where you need to have access to development tools. So you can always use the dev variant of our image, which has access to a, a larger uh, set of dev utilities. I think one of the biggest challenges we had in arriving at this place is um, the very complex uh, version matrix of all the components that together constitute Torch. Uh, and as many of you might know, most of them are quite tightly coupled. And uh, it's down to the tool chain that's actually used to uh, build Torch. Uh, there's a lot of you know, back and forth involved. I think uh, as of now, the upstream PyTorch releases, uh, cuts a new release every five weeks or so. Uh, every time a new release um, is, uh, is let out, ChainGuard builds an image for this particular uh, variant uh, in all web versions of Python that support it and other libraries. Uh, these images are constantly scanned and patched whenever there's a, a CV that, that shows up. And our images are built nightly, so really they're fresh as they come. Uh, in addition to zero CV and minimal images, we also build uh, FIPS compliant images. So a number of you might have a requirement for these images as well. Uh, Albeit a very minimal set of packages that we are shipping with our image, it's always good to know what's actually running in your system, the code that's running in your system. And to that end, the PyTorch image that we ship out comes with an S-bomb that tells you just that. Uh, the PyTorch image, just like all the other chain guard images, is compliant with the Salsa standards, which means that you get a verifiable history of the build, telling, giving you information about how the image was built, the dependencies that, that went into it, the source code, and the build system itself. So we wanted to provide you with a couple of starting places. Um, so 
If you're interested in taking a, a test drive for the recently built PyTorch image, the Zero CVF PyTorch image, um, you can take a look at this QR code on the left. That's our PyTorch image there in our image catalog. Um, another great place to start is the recently released uh, Securing the AI ML Supply Chain course, which has seven modules that cover all sorts of different things from the, compli from, uh, the compliance ecosystem, tooling, um, scanning, and also some training and inference, so using container images. It's a great place to start. Uh, similarly, uh, we do a monthly learning lab uh, focused on different secure application frameworks and, run and language runtimes. I just did one on our AI images, including PyTorch, and we have a, if you want to check out the next one coming up next month, uh, you can scan this QR code. So. We've discussed a few ways that this is Wolfie or the tiniest octopus in the world. You know, we go for minimal here, so he's going to his hole. But um, well, we're, before we get to questions, I'll just say the, the techniques we've discussed here, uh, you know, from pre building fresh, not going from five weeks to every night, uh, and including S-bombs, going minimal, these are all things that could be applied to the uh, current PyTorch image to make it more secure, and that could really affect s security uh, in production environments around the world, so thank you. All right, so I'm told there is a microphone right here in this aisle, um, and you know you may think that everyone's going to hear you. It's actually a pretty big room, so you might want to use the microphone. <laughs> um, so my question is, how do you determine um, you know what packages and executables um, are not needed in the uh, in the image without knowing you know what applications are going to be built on top of that? A very short answer is testing, but that also sounds like a Shristi question. So we try to uh, get a little bit more insight about how exactly the customer is using the application. But uh, for most part, we've come to realize that the stripped down version of Torch suffices most of the customer needs. Yeah, another way of saying that we change things if customers complain. <laughs> Anyone else? I think we have time for maybe one more. Is that? Thank you very much.